He's sitting crooked. It's straight. He's <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. She had his eyes <laughs> You have been selected to speak with us today because you have been identified as someone who has much to share about the subject of the 1979 strike at Clinton Corn Processing Company. We would like to record our conversations today. We also need you to sign a form devised to meet Augustina College's research requirements and two other forms to give the recording as a gift to the Clinton Public Library. Essentially, this document states that one, only the information you are comfortable being used in research will be used. Two, your participation is voluntary and you may stop at any time if you feel uncomfortable. And three, you may choose to remain anonymous if you wish. No. Otherwise, your name may be used in future pre um, presentations, publications, documentaries, and online material based on this research. Please sign the release forms after reading them if you agree to participate. After the recording has been transcribed, you and you have placed whatever restrictions you would like on what information will be released, then the material will be placed in the archives of Clinton Public Library permanently. Thank you for agreeing to participate. We plan this interview to take no longer than one hour. During this period, we have several questions we would like to cover. We do not foresee that any questions will make you uncomfortable, but please let us know if it does, and we can move on to another topic. Please also let us know at any point if you need to enter in the interview early, and we will shorten the interview. On the other hand, if time begins to run short, it may be necessary to interrupt you in order to push ahead and complete this line of questioning or come back for a follow-up interview. So, my name is Abby Thompson. And I'm Nicolette Sleva. And I'm Bill Nelson. <laughs> and if you could just spell your name for us, for the recording. Oh, uh, uh, say my name? Yeah, I and mean, then spell it. Well, my name is really William Nelson, but I was called Bill, yes. I worked in the research department for, I think, about 31 years before the ADM bought the, the facility, and almost all of us were uh, terminated at that time. I uh, spent a couple of years of consulting after that, most of it in, in Ontario, Canada. You know, and then I eventually came out and uh, found a job over here in Belvedere with Technicam, a supplier of iron exchange resins and equipment. They were the supplier for us over in Clinton. That's how come I got to know them. Yeah. Oh, what else? Well, we have some questions for you. Um, so, could you describe for us how you started working at Clinton Corn? How I did? Mm -hmm. Well, I started back in 1951, and the day I walked in, it was the peak of the flood for that year. And I remember walking on boardwalks all around the plant in the, in the office building. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I uh, got a graduate degree from uh, Oklahoma State University in 1950. And in that time, there were very, very few chemistry jobs available throughout the country. I had to spend a year uh, teaching in a grade school for in, until uh, in May of 1951. Then I, I found this job at Clinton Foods at that time. Yeah. So what else do I know about how? Mm -hmm. At that, at the, at the start, I don't, there really wasn't anything else. I, I know I got assigned a, a project shortly after I started there. It was a project in which, well, they were making crystalline dextrose or, or, or uh, glucose at that time, and they still do. But at that time, it was made by an acid conversion process. And in that process, uh, the, the sugar that finally uh, evolved all that process had a haze in it when they, when they reconstituted it back in, in solution. And what they wanted to know was what that haze was. <laughs> well, there was so little of it there, weight-wise, that it took me about six months to get enough to, to, uh, to run an analysis on it. It was calcium oxalate, you know, 
a very insoluble uh, salt, and it's uh, derived from the degradation of uh, glucose, and which goes into the fructose and subsequently into oxalic acid. Then there's enough calcium in the processed water to, to form the salt. And that comes out in the crystallizer, and that was what the, that was my first project. Nice. <laughs> So you didn't grow up in Clinton, did you? No, I grew up in a little town around Alpha, Illinois, just south of the Quad Cities. Okay. Yeah. Went to Augustana, yeah. Mm -hmm. From 1944 to 48, yeah. Okay. Um, can you describe for us a typical work day at the plant when it wasn't, not during the strike, just a normal day? Well, I worked in research. I didn't work in the plant. Mm -hmm. And we had a variety of projects. It was, it was a lot of bench work. And, uh, a, lot, a lot of scientific work. There's a lot of grunt work, I'll tell you that. It's not exactly uh, really uh, exciting, something like that. But, you know, we, we worked from, say, we had a quarter to eight to four o'clock for our uh, office hours. Uh, and see what well, yeah when I first started there we weren't they didn't have a laboratory they and then it was a few months after I got was there they they had remodeled an old building over not very far from the office building which we were uh, were there for about uh, what about six years I think it was about. we moved in then they built a new uh, research building. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, moved into that in 1957. I worked at the bench on a various number of projects under a supervisor for until I think it was about 1962, I think, six years, 62, I can't remember. And I, then I got the job of supervising the, one of the sections of research. It was called syrup and sugar. Anyway, it was uh, it was primarily uh, doing work on uh, hydrolysis projects, refining, mostly. Yeah, uh, we were, of course, uh, trying to come up with new some new products that was make us a little more money. The biggest project was started back in 1965, called the High Fructose Corn Syrup. Have you heard it? Mm -hmm. Well, no. this is a project uh, of this syrup revolutionized the whole sweetener industry in the country. Actually, there's, there's very few people that really realize that, because by 1990, I think about 60% of the sweetener in the country was high fructose syrup. I don't know what it is today, but uh, yeah, that was uh, it, it. Made the country, uh, the country, totally independent for a sweetener. And I'm going to inject one thing here. I hear see some things on some products out there now say uh, no fry fructose syrup, and implying that it is not really good for you. Well, that rather irritates me because. What they don't tell you is then is that the sugar, the cane sugar, and the beet sugar that you use, that's sucrose. When that hits your stomach, it, it hydrolyzes to substantially the same thing as high fructose syrup. And uh, so I think their advertising is a little bit off color. <laughs> oh, where are we going now? So. But, uh, oh yeah, we, we had a number of other syrups we introduced before that. Uh, and I got a number of patents on some, some syrups and a few other things. They all they did was really muddy the waters. Kept, <laughs> they, they really weren't that. Big. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to uh, trigger my mem memory again here. <laughs> Um, we've heard that Clinton Corn held the Japanese patent for corn syrup, and that that was kind of big for the company. Could you tell us about that? The Japanese patent? No, there wasn't a Japanese patent that I remember. Our research director 
and then the microbiology supervisor went to Japan in 1965. What they did get, and they, they brought it through a customs, I don't think, uh, let them know, the, uh, a, a sample of the, um, the bug that made the enzyme, the isomerase enzyme. And then we had the rights to, to uh, work with the process for six months, as I recall, to see if we, it was worthwhile. What we got from the Japanese was far from a potential uh, or, a, or a commercial product at that time. It wouldn't have gone anywhere mm -hmm. with what we got. But we did get the, the bug. And uh, what they had done as far as uh, processing, that is the isomerization and the, and the refining of it. We spent about six months, well at first, yeah, something like that. I, I'll admit, I think, our own sales department really did, wasn't very strongly behind us on this. I don't know why, but I think we're, we had a very, very good research director, Bob McAllister. He was, he was very bright and he very wise. He was the one that really pushed this thing from originally. Oh my God, I have to go back. The reason we got connected with the, the Japanese was the Clinton Company had a relationship with a, 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 a company in Tokyo. What was it? San Matsu. Yeah, that was the name of San Matsu. What was it? it was something else. Sure, company anyway is what it was. And they, and they even actually, and then, oh, that's right. The fellow that uh, discovered or found the, uh, the isomerase, or the bug that did make the isomerase enzyme, the Japanese, he worked for the Japanese government. And he was over for a few months with us. He, he was very secretive, as I remember. <laughs> he was so darn afraid he wasn't going to get her everything out of that he, that he thought he should have. But anyway, at first, it, see, we were, we spent about for at least six months, and, and the whole project, all during that time, didn't really look very good. The syrup was highly colored, and uh, there were a lot of other things about it that wasn't going to be acceptable. But when, uh, particularly Bob and Counselor, he's one that could see, he had vision, he could see what, what it could uh, develop into being the greatest source of sweetener mm -hmm. in the country, I'm sure is what he was thinking. Anyway, we, it didn't look very good and we were, see, we were given at least six months, as I recall, to work on it before we were, if it didn't look good, then we're, they were going to cut it off, our funds, and we weren't going to get any more funds to work on it. Well, by that time, we had some indication that it, it, we might be able to make it. So we continued on for, and that was in 1965. And we then spent, well, by improvements in the fermentation to make the enzyme, We got, we got better yields of uh, the fructose, as, as I recall. And uh, with a, a lot of refining, my, and the kind of refining we had, it required a lot of carbon treatment and a lot of ion exchange uh, designization or treatment. We did finally make a, a product, I remember, we spent one weekend, my group and I spent one of my week, week, weekend making some of that. And uh, it was apparently good enough that it encouraged all of the management to go ahead on this. Mm -hmm. And by uh, 
1968, we sold our first car of fructose syrup. It contained only 13% thir fructose, I recall, because we had to blend the some of the isomerized syrup, because at that time I did, it was all batch reactions. And it got all kinds of color. And, and the whole, the whole enzyme broth was dumped in with the, the syrup substrate. So it wasn't, it wasn't a very efficient way to go, but it was, that was the, just the beginning. But we did by that process, we made one car of syrup. I remember that in 1968. I don't remember who used it. I think one of the early people that began to use it were the Ketsa people. Heinz Ketsa was one of them. Which, incidentally, now is. I'll transgress just a little bit here. They're, they're currently, they merged with Kraft Foods. Well, now that's where what pension I get and my health benefits all come through them. <laughs> it traveled through a number of mergers and sales, mm -hmm. my our pension and benefits. <clears throat> I'll, we'll get on to that later. But let's see, back then, yeah, we made that, that syrup. But it wasn't too long after that. This, uh, the enzyme, we, oh, the enzyme was immobilized on an, on an, uh, cellulose, ethyl, diethyl aminose, ethyl cellulose, I think it was, and that changed everything. When you could transfer, go through in a continuous process, you didn't make a lot of the undesirable products mm -hmm. that uh, the batch process did. And uh, that we make up to 42% fructose in it. And that's one of the products that's being sold today, yeah. That was in, early, in the early 70s. Somewhere about the middle of the 70s. Uh, well, of course, they were trying to get into the, the, the whole entire food market and, and the soda pop, because that was... A, that was known to be a huge market, and it was. Um, but the 42% the, the didn't quite meet their sweetness level. So we had to uh, figure out another way to make a higher, higher concentration. Well, we, there was, a, see, I think it was Dell that had a patent out on fractionating, I was passing fructose and glu uh, glucose syrups uh, through the non-exchange resin in the calcium form. And what that does is the, the uh, calcium form retards the, uh, yeah, the passage of the, the glucose and the other poly polysaccharides in there, fructose being coming out first. And they could, with that, you could make up to 90% product. And today, I think even ADM is making 100%, I think. But then that was blended back with the 42 to make a 55% product, which is in your pop. That's what's in there now. The market then really took off when, when the, the so I think it was, um, Dr. Pepper, the first, one of our first customers. Well, that was up at the bottom, that was the late 70s. And by, the, by uh, 1980, 81, things were really rolling. Well, see, the company licensed uh, A.E. Staley because P, uh, customers wouldn't buy anything from, they didn't want to have just one customer source. They wanted to, so we we licensed them. And it wasn't long after they all started making. <clears throat> there were other people that made uh, the isomerase enzyme. I probably should go back all and really describe the process a little bit for you. Be great. 